Uh, well, welcome to our first uh, Tocqueville lecture of the spring semester. Uh, the Tocqueville lecture series is named after Alexis Tocqueville, uh, born of the French aristocracy. Tocqueville examined the world to understand democracy. His investigation convinced him that liberal ideas, which rejected both the antiquity of aristocracy and doubted the promises of the French Revolution, were the progression of history. Whether individuals fought for or against these ideals, he was convinced that equality of conditions is a providential fact. This lecture series invites scholars, professionals, and civic leaders to present on the ideas of liberty and equality as they relate to other concepts important, important in the founding and continuation of American government. Hosted on the campus of Jacksonville State University, these free lectures are open to the public. We welcome the campus, community, and country to listen, think, reflect, and engage with each other. The Tocqueville Lecture Series is funded by generous grants from the Jack Miller Center and the Alabama Humanities Alliance. The Jack Miller Center is dedicated to advancing education in America's history, its political and economic institution, and the central principles, ideas, and issues arising from the American and Western traditions, which continue to animate our national life. The Alabama Humanities Alliance exists to provide context, build empathy, and make the state of Alabama a more vibrant place to live through all the humanities, especially. It's my pleasure tonight uh, to be uh, able to host uh, Dr. Uh, Rita uh, Kozania, uh, nah, I apologize, uh, Koganza. Uh, she is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Houston, uh, where she teaches political theory. Her research focuses on themes of education, childhood, authority, and the family in the historical and contemporary political thought. She's the author of Liberal States, Authoritarian Families, Childhood and Education, Early Modern Thought through Oxford University Press, as well as numerous academic articles and essays on the themes of education, childhood, authority, and the family in historical and contemporary political thought. Uh, her writings have been published in the Hedgehog Review, National Affairs, The Point, and the Chronicle of Higher Education, among others, also including uh, the American Political Science Review, which is one of our top publications for political scientists. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to hand it off to her. Uh, I'll uh, mute myself here, and then uh, we'll have some time for Q&A later. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Gross, and thanks for inviting me. Um, so I want to talk this evening about the American tradition of hating school. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, to offer a little PowerPoint, uh, but mainly that's not, it's going to be me. Um, let me get this up. Okay, here we go. Uh, so hating school may not sound like something that would contribute to democracy, the theme of this lecture series. Um, hating school is something we associate more with miscreants than with upstanding citizens. But I wanna suggest that this association is at least in part a mistake and that there are virtues in our hatred of school. But first I should clarify that it's not at all obvious that we do hate school. I suspect that almost none of you, if I asked you, would describe yourselves as haters of school. On the contrary, you spent more than the legally required amount of time in school. Uh, you might plan to spend more still. You've probably done fairly well in school and you've probably mostly enjoyed it. You may believe that education can be transformative for the individual and for society uh, and transformative in a good way. It can make people better, smarter, richer, more productive, more compassionate and just maybe, better human beings and citizens as one philosopher of education named Socrates once put it. Far from hating school, you might actually love school, at least in theory. The lovers of school have dominated American political discussion of education from the founding to the present. In recent decades, this bias in favor of schooling has been strengthened in part because the journalists, policymakers, educators, and politicians who contribute uh, to the public discourse about education are a lot like you in the sense that they're people who've liked and benefited a lot from success in school. They're naturally disposed to praise schooling uh, as a solution to all kinds of social problems that have no directly obvious connection to school, like poverty, crime, drug abuse, political corruption. Uh, but although the public emphasis on the value and virtue of schooling might be a little stronger today than it was in the past, it's hardly a new phenomenon. 
the U.S. has a long-standing tradition of educational thinking that valorizes universal schooling. This tradition that I'll call uh, the democratic tradition, uh, the democratic educational tradition, can be traced from Thomas Jefferson and most of the founders who called for the creation of local and state schools through the 19th century reformers like Horace Mann, uh, who started the common school movement, and progressive reformers who pushed to make schooling compulsory for all American children. Even today's school reformers are broadly part of this democratic tradition in education. The democratic tradition of education understands the public schools as the institutional bedrock of a successful democratic republic. Universal schooling imparts both the civic knowledge and the vocational skills that make us politically competent and economically independent. In short, good schooling makes us good citizens. Schooling also cultivates friendships across all kinds of divides. Originally in the 18th century, these would be religious divisions, but now they're more like racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic divisions. And these friendships hold together the extended republic of uh, varied and opposing interests that James Madison describes in Federalist Number 10. This democratic tradition of education insists that public schooling is the best route to achieving these goods for the majority of Americans and aspires to put high quality schooling within the reach of all. The democratic tradition is America's primary public approach to education. And it's a good tradition with a salutary goal, but sometimes it overreaches. Sometimes educators and political thinkers conclude that because public schools can solve some civic challenges, they might be made to solve all of our social problems and political problems if only we could compel everyone to attend, uh, attend public schools and only public schools. Such totalizing ambitions are also quite old and they recur periodically in our history. In the 18th century, Benjamin Rush published an educational proposal describing how, quote, the whole nation will be tied together by one system of education that would, quote, convert men into Republican machines. That didn't happen in his lifetime, of course, but by the late 19th century, most states did have a system of public elementary schools. After that, the project of Republican reformers was to make attendance compulsory, that is, required by law for every child. This project was, was comprised of progressives, nativists, and the KKK in some occasions, um, and uh, was very successful at the beginning of the 20th century. So they moved on to the goal of a cohesive national public education system, one that would prohibit all private schooling in favor of universal mandatory public schooling. But at that point, the court, the court stopped short, stepped in, and the Supreme Court decision in Pierce v. Society of Sisters, a very famous case about education, put out that fire. For the next 50 years, there was a kind of truce between public school maximalists and moderates. The settlement was that public school would be universally available, but not universally required. Compulsory attendance laws could still be satisfied by sending children to private and religious schools instead, if that's what parents wanted. Eventually in the 1970s and 80s, even compulsory attendance laws were rolled back to permit homeschooling and other educational experiments. Today, however, the maximalist ambition of some in the democratic tradition has resurfaced. Some writers and policymakers concerned about the role of private schools in exacerbating socioeconomic inequality and perpetuating racism have called for their abolition or at least for heavy handed regulation. The recent turn against charter schools and vouchers within the Democratic Party is another instance of this periodically resurgent ambition towards compulsion and uniformity. In the background, there always remains the persistent reform impulse to offer more and better schooling as a solution to all kinds of social problems. I don't think that we're in any great danger of this push for centralization and uniformity imminently winning out. Americans are very comfortable for now with decentralization, school choice, and even homeschooling, comfortable enough to defend them against political attack. But so that we don't lose what is good about the democratic tradition to this impulse to overreach, I think it's important to put it in its place to see that public schooling has never been universally revered in our history. And the way to do that, I think, is to bring to light a competing American educational tradition, what I'm gonna call here the liberal tradition. The liberal tradition is an ongoing argument that schooling, both public and private schooling, is nefarious, that it's intellectually stifling, and it's to be tolerated as minimally as possible. 
It, it's this argument, I think, little noticed in our public educational discourse that I want to shed some light on. So the democratic tradition has a long pedigree dating back to the Renaissance. Early modern Republicans supported public schooling as a civic necessity, arguing that the widespread diffusion of knowledge and the cultivation of, of patriotic virtue were necessary to defend liberty against tyranny. Americans who advocated for public education, like Benjamin Rush and Thomas Jefferson, were following an illustrious precedent. But a liberal counterargument uh, had more recently begun to coalesce in the 18th century in the influential works of philosophers like Jean, John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and even Adam Smith to some degree. And they called into question the benefits of schooling for individual freedom. So Locke's book, Some Thoughts concerning education and Rousseau's book, Emile, two of the most widely read and influential educational treatises of the 18th century, agreed that education should aim at virtue and freedom, but argued that these ends couldn't be attained through institutional schooling. The freedom that they emphasized was individual moral and intellectual freedom, the freedom from custom, fashion, and prejudice, rather than the collective freedom of the nation. A strong republic requires substantial uniformity in belief and conduct, uh, but the cultivation of such uniformity through education threatens the intellectual freedom that Locke and Rousseau prized. So they turned against this democratic republican tradition and argued that education should take place in the home under the guidance of tutors or better yet, parents themselves. According to these thinkers, the threat of other children and of the larger society, especially urban society, and consequently of the school is essentially a threat to liberty. Send your child to school and he'll be governed there, not by upstanding and exemplary teachers, but by neglectful idlers. And worst of all, by other children who are as ignorant as yours, but in numbers much more vicious. So Locke says in some thoughts concerning education, till you can find a school wherein it is possible for the master to look after the manners of his scholars, you must confess that you think it worthwhile to hazard your son's innocence and virtue for a little Greek and Latin. For as for that boldness and spirit which lads get amongst their playfellows at school, it has ordinarily such a mixture of rudeness and an ill-turned confidence that those misbecoming and disingenuous ways of shifting in the world must be unlearned and all the tincture washed out again to make way for better principles and such manners as make a truly worthy man. He that considers how diametrically opposed the skill of living well and managing as a man should do his affairs in the world is to that malapertness, tricking or violence learned among schoolboys will think the fault of a private or education infinitely to be preferred to such improvements and will take care to preserve his child's innocence and modesty at home. So Locke and Rousseau point out all the ways that children are like tyrants to one another. Perhaps you might recall this from your own experiences of middle school. The moral authority of the peer group over the individual is nearly omnipotent, and it's rarely wielded in the service of virtue and intellectual liberty. If you want your child to be free, you have to educate him at home. So understood from this perspective, the school is not a minor inconvenience, but a potential danger to the entire American project insofar as the American project was grounded in political arguments and especially in an understanding of individual liberty that was derived from these very thinkers. How then could early Americans who were readers and followers of Locke uh, and Smith on political questions and Rousseau on educational ones simply dismiss their warnings about education and express such enthusiasm for the very system that their liberal guides condemned? Well, the American proponents of public education did to some degree address these anti-institutional arguments, but not by rejecting schools entirely. Even those who sympathized with the Lockean objections believed that the civic and economic benefits of schooling outweighed its harms. The home education extolled in Locke's and Rousseau's treatises was for Europe's landed gentry, families who were not engaged in day-to-day money-making and had the leisure to tutor their children or the means to hire someone else to do so. The American colonies and the early Republic had very few such people. The desire for education far outstripped the ability of most Americans to either pay private tutors or teach children themselves. Public schooling in America was desirable because it solved a pressing social and economic, if not quite a political problem. So the most important counterargument against public schooling in America was never one that denied the need for schools, uh, 
or appeal to this kind of isolated domestic education uh, that Locke and Rousseau proposed. It instead preserved the spirit of their individualism by accepting, sometimes even promoting schooling, and then turning around to deride it and rebel against it. This mischievous American compromise is first exemplified in the life and writings of Benjamin Franklin. Franklin neither explicitly defended nor opposed Locke's arguments about schooling. He took an entirely different approach using his own life to model an education that avoided dependence on formal schooling. In its place, he elevated informal self-education outside of school and with friends as the kind of quintessentially American coming of age experience. Franklin was very influenced by Locke, but he was also the youngest son of the 17 children of a Boston candle maker. So a private tutor for him was out of the question. So he improvised his own version of Locke's education adapted to American conditions. As the quote, youngest son of the youngest son for five generations back and the youngest of 17, Franklin's chances of making much of himself were pretty slim. The inheritance laws of England, as in most aristocracies, privileged eldest sons and offered little to anyone else in the family. But Franklin was in luck because America, the American colonies at least, were a society of youngest sons, the beneficiaries of primogeniture tending like Franklin's eldest uncle to stay back in England where they were gonna benefit the most. Franklin received only two years of formal schooling, one at the Boston Latin School, the oldest public school in the country, which still exists today, by the way, and one at a proprietary secretarial school in Boston. Then he was drawn, withdrawn by his father and apprenticed to his older brother, James, as a printer. Although Franklin's formal schooling ended at age 10, he mentions this in his autobiography only in passing and without much lament. He had done well at Boston Latin, but lagged in arithmetic at the secretarial school. And that was all there is to say about those years because it was only after them that he believed his education really commenced. The autobiography is most famous for its detailed account of Franklin's self-education. And this is indeed Franklin's signal and original contribution to American educational thought. Franklin's self-education was grounded on two pillars, self-discipline and like-minded friends. These supports together formed a substitute for a Lockean tutor and Franklin's account of how he cultivated them makes up much of the autobiography. So self-discipline was necessary in Franklin's constrained financial circumstances to find the time for him to read and study. But self-restraint for young men was not exactly encouraged by the social conditions of the colonies. Even before he ran away to Philadelphia at age 17, Franklin had been left largely unsupervised in Boston by his father and his older brother, James, to whom he was apprenticed. Once he broke his apprenticeship and escaped to Philadelphia, he was entirely on his own. During all this, what he calls dangerous time of youth and the hazardous situations I was sometimes in among strangers, Franklin says he abandoned his family's congregationalism for a hedonistic deism that he also admits perverted his friends and encouraged them into all kinds of debauchery. He succumbed to what he called that hard to be governed passion of youth so often that he escaped contracting syphilis only by great good luck, as he puts it. He stole another one of his brother's money, became a mark of a scamming governor, broke his engagement to his eventual wife, encouraged his friend to abandon his own wife and child to take up with a mistress. Then he tried to steal that mistress from him. And that's only what he was willing to admit in print. So with adult supervision in such short supply in the colonies, children would require other means of self-discipline to avoid succumbing to these numerous temptations of city life. What saved uh, Franklin was his, quote, bookish inclination. His early love of philosophy and disputation required him to squirrel away both his extra money and his extra time to pursue it. He parlayed his brother's connections to booksellers to borrow their books. He stayed up late at night reading. He realized that he could gain an entire day for reading by skipping Sunday church services. Uh, and that was very convenient for a secret unbeliever. Then he discovered vegetarianism, which saved him money, time, and focus for his studies since his dietary restrictions prevented him from going out for long, expensive beer-fueled meals at alehouses with his coworkers from the printing shop. Bookishness also meant that Franklin could acquire, his, acquire friends who served as other sources of support for his self-education. 
For Locke, the central pedagogical figure was the tutor or the father who undertook tutorial duties. But as we've seen, these were scarcely to be found in Franklin's America. Nonetheless, sociability is a foundational virtue in Franklin's scheme, and he by no means intended self-education to be a solitary pursuit. So friends replaced tutors. His friends were his interlocutors, his competitors, and his goads to self-improvement. He honed his prose with them, he improved his arguments, he swapped books, and he eventually even went into business with some of them. Most importantly, these intellectual friendships, because they took place away from adult attention, were also free from the intellectual impositions of adults. All the rigid theolog theological doctrine that Franklin's father hoped to teach him with his collection of Puritan polemic divinity, and that Harvard would have at great expense of time and money drummed into him had he graduated from Boston Latin, was casually cast aside by Franklin and his friends. Their openness and candor with one another permitted them to test and at times to exceed the limits of respectable thought. Franklin's scheme of self-education with his friends also circumvented the intellectually dangerous peer dynamic that Locke had warned against. Franklin's friends were a few self-selected fellow bookish lads and lovers of reading whose shared purpose set them apart from and implicitly against other boys. Such friendships could support intellectual independence without falling prey to a schoolyard herd mentality. But not every boy was as bookish by disposition as Franklin was. His bookishness had led him to self-discipline and like-minded friends, but that couldn't be expected to work for everyone else. So Franklin came up with a way to make self-education replicable and accessible, even to the less intellectually inclined. He did this by promoting voluntary associations, beginning with the model of his Junto, a Philadelphia debating and mutual improvement society uh, that he founded together with a few other tradesmen. The rules for the Junto were designed to keep its members, to, to help its members do what we would today call networking. Uh, but the structure of the club also smuggled in a demand for reading and study, requiring its members to discuss weekly, quote, any point of morals, politics, or natural philosophy of general interest. And they also required each member to periodically, quote, read an essay of his own writing on any subject he pleased for the sake of starting a discussion. Even if they were not naturally bookish like Franklin, the Junto's members, drawn in by the appeal of camaraderie and professional advantage, were subjected to a fairly substantive scientific and philosophical education in the process. Indeed, Franklin tellingly calls the Junto, quote, the best school of philosophy, morals, and politics that then existed in the province, province being Pennsylvania, that a secret club, rather than any institutional school, should merit this title, returns us to Franklin's insistence that a good education need not be, and probably should not be, a formal one. The Junto provided the social and political foundation for Franklin to launch many of his later associations. Uh, <clears throat> he uh, started the first lending library, the first fire company, the first public hospital in the colonies, the first university in Pennsylvania and its first militia, and Philadelphia's first night watch system. Each of these associations had its own inducements to participation, and each appealed to quite different segments of the city's population, from mechanics and tradesmen to merchants and the political elite, tying them into overlapping social networks, pooling their resources and instructing them through practice in the art of associating and working with others for common ends. Some of the associations like the Junto and the library were educational in kind of the academic sense, uh, but all of them were educational in the formative sense. The autobiography offers these associations just as examples of what's possible. But the fact that several of the associations that Franklin himself started in the 18th century like the American Philosophical Society and the University of Pennsylvania are still functioning today, over 300 years later, is a testament to how well suited Franklin's approach was to the unique constraints and advantages of American life. These elements of Franklin's early self-education, self-discipline in the form of save time and money and intellectual friendships were suited to the relatively democratic condition of the colonies where the youngest sons of meager means abounded while institutional schools were few and expensive. 
Franklin hit upon an educational formula that would allow talented and ambitious men to advance themselves without relying on credentials and institutions, and that would at the same time achieve most of the intellectual ends of Locke's tutorial education at home. Franklin's self-education harnessed American children's early freedom from supervision, encouraging the intellectual independence that such unsupervised conditions promote. But the independence that was such a boon to Franklin turned out to be a curse to some of his friends. His uh, childhood friend, John Collins, for example, whose natural gifts Franklin ranked above his own, succumbed early on to the temptations that a city frequently dangles in front of unrestrained young men, drunkenness and debt. Without protection against such temptations, boys like Collins and others in Franklin's autobiography squander their potential. And this is a waste that Franklin thought America could ill afford. So Franklin touted self-education, but he spent his adult life building schools. He may not have needed schools for his education, but he saw that most Americans probably would. The key though, is that they shouldn't need them too much. Franklin's compromise was to accept that the new Republic must have schools, but to deny that all or even most of what he understood as education, broadly speaking, would take place in them. Collins might have been kept from the dramming, as it's called in the 18th century, that did him in had he been constrained by school for a few years. But eventually, and far earlier probably than we would today think is permissible, he would still set off on his own to establish himself in the relatively open society around him. And that process would mark his real education as it did for Franklin. Even for children attending school, the world outside of it still dominated and limited the moral and intellectual influence of the school. The unschooled summers, and for many years and many children, also autumns and springs, unsupervised time with friends and the adult livelihoods not dependent on institutional credentials diminished the formative power of schools for a long time. Franklin's example of self-making, the process of leaving one's childhood home and making a life away from, and often enough against one's upbringing, has become a regular trope of American coming of age, long after the advent of universal schooling. Indeed, the autobiography's popularity grew along with the expansion of schooling in the United States in the 19th century by defending a place for anti-institutional self-education alongside institutional schooling, Franklin provided a liberal counter-argument against the democratic advocates of universal public schooling. Franklin's was only the first such counter-argument. He inaugurated a tradition of American thinking about education that accepted the democratic necessity of public schooling on the one hand, but retained the older liberal suspicion of its stifling moral and intellectual effects. This tradition, the liberal tradition, reconciled the tension by promoting schools while denying that schools ought to provide the whole or even the majority of education. The school might still be a necessary prerequisite, but in this tradition, it would also be an antagonist and education would be a process that occurs against or in spite of schools. It would not be quite the home education that Locke and Rousseau proposed, though the home could contribute to it, but the important American move was to substitute self-education for home education in an effort to preserve the same goal, intellectual liberty, by different means. Americans writing in this liberal educational tradition have not generally come from within the educational establishment. They have instead been writers, artists, journalists, directors, the makers of a popular culture skeptical of school that's saturated with positive and even heroic depictions of childhood rebellion against school that populate our cultural imagination. This tradition has grown up alongside our professional educational establishment and our systems of institutional schooling incorporating the institutions and then mocking, belittling, and rejecting them in the name of independence. Consider Mark Twain's Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, two iconic depictions of childhood rebellion against the conformity of institutional education. Tom and Huck are both surrounded by well-intentioned schools and teachers trying to civilize them with an S, as Mark Twain spells it. They rebel in ways small, in Tom's case, and large, in Huck's, against these efforts, and their real education occurs almost entirely outside of school, in the woods or on the river. And what they learn away from school is more true and significant than anything that their civilizing teachers offer them. 
Twain is only apocryphally credited with originating the quip, don't let school interfere with your education. But you can see why people might attribute this sentiment to him. So Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn are classic boys books in the American canon. Little Women, written just a few years earlier, offers an analogous lesson to girls. Little Women takes place in Massachusetts during the height of the common school movement, but only one of the March sisters, Amy, is actually in school in the book, while another is deemed too bashful to attend and stays home. Amy's experience in school is almost entirely taken up with status competition, uh, vanity, and overbearing teachers. After one particularly humiliating incident with pickled limes, her mother pulls her out of school for the rest of the book, a decision that seems to please everyone. School only exacerbates moral weaknesses in Little Women, as Locke and Rousseau argued that it would. Whatever academic foundation their schooling may have laid for them, it's clear that the March sisters' real moral and literary educations take place at home, in their attic, with each other, and with their friends. Another example, a little bit later for adults, is Henry Adams. Henry Adams understood himself as updating Franklin's model, and so tied himself directly to the liberal tradition in his preface to the, his book, The Education of Henry Adams. He wrote, American literature offers scarcely one working model for high education. The student must go back beyond Jean-Jacques Rousseau to Benjamin Franklin to find a model even of self-teaching. Adams took the same reluctant and ultimately resistant attitude towards school as his predecessors in the liberal tradition had taken. He counted as his education only what happened to him after and against what he learned in school. The problem with his schools, Adams claimed, was that they tried to assimilate children into the world of the previous generation, the world of his grandfather, John Quincy Adams. But that world was already unnoticeably passing away and issuing in the Industrial Revolution and the Machine Age, as Adams called it. Adams worried that this new Machine Age uh, brought forth by science, by secularization, by industrialization, would reorganize American society in nihilistic and dehumanizing ways. As far as this re reorganization concerned education, it meant the adoption of compulsory schooling at the end of the 19th century. By 1918, school attendance was legally required in every state. All these 19th century novels and memoirs that I just mentioned depict a time when schooling was not yet compulsory, escape was still possible, and it was free of serious consequences. No truant officer ever shows up at the widow Douglas's door asking after Huck's whereabouts or demands an official medical expl explanation for Beth March's bashfulness. Compulsory year-long schooling, however, meant that putting on plays in your attic or running away into the woods instead of reporting to school every week would become no more than a reader's wistful daydream. The minimally schooled childhoods of Tom and Huck and the March sisters were in danger of becoming mere nostalgia. In a more centralized and regimented society, one that was obsessed with social efficiency, childhood was being put to more efficient uses and its errors were less easily forgiven or left behind. This was a high watermark for the democratic educational tradition in America. Progressive reformers all over the country had set to work standardizing, centralizing, and bureaucratizing schooling in their quest for the one best system, as the historian David Tiak has called it. In addition to their victory in compulsory attendance, these reformers modernized school buildings. They disseminated textbooks, they introduced oversight boards, standardized examinations, and graded classes. Against these enormous transformations in everyday educational experience, the liberal tradition, the one skeptical of schooling, seemed only to offer nostalgia. The broad consensus, as Henry Adams understood, was that the country had turned decisively away from its early Republican way of life, and mass schooling was now necessary to train effective and efficient citizens and workers. If the liberal tradition was to have a future in this new America, charming tales of truant children would no longer suffice. It would have to find a, ground, a grounding in the new ideas through which political life itself were coming to be understood, the burgeoning social sciences and the evolutionary theories of state and society deriving from Charles Darwin. Its rescue came from an unlikely source. It was the psychologist G. Stanley Hall who injected the truculence of Huck and Henry into a respectably social scientific conception of normal childhood in his 1904 study, Adolescence. 
Paul turned the tendency towards individualistic rebellion into a bona fide stage of human development. He defined adolescence by its opposition to institutions and to authorities, and thereby lent scientific credibility to the tendency of American children to hate school. Worse, he turned parents into accomplices and sometimes even cheerleaders of their children's rebellion, since a failure to rebel might come to suggest some kind of dreaded abnormality in development. By clothing it in the trappings of science, Hall preserved a continued popular skepticism of institutional schooling during precisely the decades when it underwent its most rapid and ambitious expansion. By the post-war period, nearly every American child under 16 who wasn't severely ill or disabled was in school full-time, and the various experiences of schooling, both good and bad, appear to have been cemented as the social backdrop of American coming of age. So we could say, well, school supplied the characters and the settings, let's say, for childhood's major tropes. There were the inspiring teachers and the villainous teachers, the bullies and the best friends, the crushes and the breakups. There were the cafeteria and the schoolyard where social group conflicts play out. The gym classes where every imaginable form of physical humiliation was inflicted. Uh, the English classes where apparently all psychological and intellectual epiphanies in books and movies originate. But our literature and film for both children and adults continue to celebrate failures to conform, uh, the rebels and outcasts. Even earnest works like Beverly Cleary's enormously popular Ramona series from the 1960s upheld the imperative of individualism and resistance against school authority, lionizing its accidentally but chronically insubordinate heroine Ramona at the expense of her goody two-shoes sister Beezus. And this is to say nothing of the popularity of Roald Dahl's viciously anti-school books in the United States or the rise of the thoroughly anti-adult genre of young adult or YA literature in the 1970s. At the same time, a serious political movement was forming against schooling for the first time. A very strange bedfellows coalition of evangelical and fundamentalist Christians on the one hand and secular new left activists on the other came together to challenge compulsory schooling laws and demand to be allowed to homeschool their children. The Christians, inspired by theologians like Gresham Meacham and J.R. Rushduni, argued that education was wholly a parental duty and that schooling, particularly public schooling, smuggled an anti-Christian worldview in the guise of neutrality or secularism. The leftists, like Ivani Leach and John Holt, for their part, objected to the stifling conformity that institutional schooling imposed on children alleging that schools squashed creativity and even the natural ethical impulses of children. By the 1990s, their followers had successfully legalized homeschooling in every state and opened the door to the kaleidoscope of educational alternatives to schools that we have today, micro schools, hybrid schools, co-op schools, and so on, as well as to the innovations of the education reform movement that began in the 1990s. This homeschooling movement has remained kind of at the margins of American education. Demographically, only about five to 8% of school children in the United States are not enrolled in some kind of school, whether public or private. But it has nonetheless become an important legal and cultural check against the overreach of the democratic tradition in American education. The 20th century closed not with the grudging acceptance of a little bit of adolescent acting out, but with the cultural elevation and embrace of the teenage school hater. Perhaps the most iconic late 20th century installment of the liberal school hating tradition is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. School is represented there by the economics teacher played by Ben Stein, droning in a perfect monotone about New Deal monetary policy. Anyone? Anyone, he pleads with his nearly comatose students to, re to respond. Meanwhile, our eponymous hero, Ferris Bueller, is spending his day cutting his classes and cruising around Chicago, having the time of his life with his friends while evading the hapless school dean. This is the liberal school-hating tradition in American education. In making light of his own adolescence in Chicago suburbs, John Hughes, the director, set out one of the defining late 20th century depictions of American adolescence. And it's nothing short of a valorization of the kid who doesn't let his schooling get in the way of his education. You might object that whether Americans remain culturally suspicious of institutional schooling is a question of very vague feelings, not the empirical reality that concerns policymakers. 
But I think that when we consider the durability of American antipathy towards school, we might learn something about why we always seem to fall short uh, of creating the one best system that the democratic tradition in American education is always seeking. Maybe in spite of all the most earnest efforts of reformers and philanthropists and educators, Americans don't really want to get it right, or at least not completely right. That is, you might like school, but you probably also like Ferris Bueller, if you've seen the movie. And if you haven't, you should see it. Americans have more or less accepted the basic democratic necessity of schooling, of our regime's civic and economic need for some reliable baseline of education, but we still harbor Locke's and Rousseau's fears of a tyranny of popular opinion and of its effect on the young. We might call these fears by new names in obeisance to popular psychology, peer pressure, conformism, maybe bullying at the extreme end, but they're the same old threats to intellectual liberty and originality that Franklin's self-education was designed to guard against. We know that schools, despite the valuable service they really do perform in our democracy, nonetheless facilitate a form of social tyranny. And so we subtly, informally, resist them. The liberal school-hating tradition has rarely been a self-conscious or organized movement, and it has no institutions. It has no multi-point agenda to advance. It's not an argument for the abolition or the privatization of the public schools because it also recognizes their usefulness. It even wants them to be good, to instill the universal literacy and numeracy required for subsequent self-education. It just doesn't want them to become too good, too totalizing, too formative, too effective. It wants to preserve a sphere of independence for children to be skeptical of authority and received opinion and to inoculate themselves against it. Now, this long account of American school hating has been mainly historical, but we might wonder, what does the liberal tradition in education do for us today? First, I think it explains the persistence of some of the stubbornly irrational and inefficient aspects of our educational system. For example, almost no developed country in the world has as decentralized and chaotic an educational system as the US. We have over 13,000 locally controlled public school districts in the United States, each with its own oversight body and policies. And we have semi-publicly controlled charters, private schools, parochial schools, homeschools, unschools, and various mixtures of all these things. By contrast, most of our international competitors have centrally administered education, or at least uniform national curricula, or both. Their teachers have more education and higher social status, especially relative to their levels of education than ours. We often lament this about our educational system, but I don't think these aspects of American education are accidental or even necessarily regrettable. Decentralization is not the same thing as anti-institutionalism, but it's a form of institutionalism that allows for variety and so acts as a counterweight against the democratic impulses towards centralization and uniformity. So from the liberal school-hating perspective, it's worth defending against the impulse to create a national curriculum and consolidate and rationalize our educational system. We lament the, so the low social status and low pay of school teachers. Some of, this is some of this low status is basically imaginary. American teachers are actually paid quite well and retain relatively high levels of social trust relative to most other countries. But it is true that teaching is a somewhat more competitive and prestigious occupation in the countries that outperform us on international tests, countries like Finland and Korea. But I think the reason we devalue teachers is because of our broader skepticism of the authority of schools, which extends to everyone who's part of them. This too is salutary to an extent, since it makes us more willing to doubt moralistic propaganda of all kinds from either side of the political spectrum. Second, the liberal tradition is anti-utopian about the possibilities of schooling, even good schooling. It pushes against our recurring utopianism about using schooling to solve all our social problems. Because no school can ultimately overcome the difficulties of outnumbered adult authority and the tyrannical rule of other children that Locke and Rousseau feared, even the best school is not sufficient for a complete education. This last point is important because we could easily say that Franklin's model of self-education is a nice idea, but woefully unsuited and out of touch with modern political and economic conditions. 
The fear that we're suddenly facing unprecedented new political and economic challenges is often what motivates our habitual pleas for more schooling as the solution. Schooling was the proposed solution to the geopolitical rivalry of the Cold War, to economic globalization in the 1990s, to the recent technological shifts in production and work, to racial and class inequality, and to the fear of civic decline. Even sober economists like Claudia Golden and Lawrence Katz have argued that our under-regulated, decentralized American approach to education may have served us well enough in the past, but it's no longer keeping up with technological change and has to be substantially expanded and made more rigorous for the 21st century. The democratic tradition reasonably asks of its liberal critics, how are Ben Franklin and Huck Finn and Joe March going to help us do that? But before we accept that the liberal tradition is no longer relevant or has no place in our educational thinking today and concede that only a thorough commitment to expansive schooling can answer our pressing political challenges, we might recall and consider our school's recent response to the, pre the pressing challenge of the COVID pandemic. When put to the test, most of the largest and wealthiest districts in the country responded with an answer, virtual learning, that was less educational for most children than running off to the woods with their friends to play pirates like Tom Sawyer. The flexibility required to continue education during the pandemic came almost entirely from families and private and non-traditional schools. It came from people who could imagine education beyond and outside of the, con the conventional institutional framework of schooling. Given that the democratic education tradition hardly had all the answers last time that it was put to the test, we might at least doubt uh, the solidity of its vision for the future. The liberal school-hating tradition, like many other forms of liberal anti-institutionalism, have long held American ambitions to uniformity and centralization in check. And it's by no means obvious that the kind of intellectual liberty that it defends will be less useful to us in the future than it has been in the past. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuganz. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to give some time here for our audience to uh, either raise their hands and then I can unmute them. They can ask a question or they can uh, type a question in the Q&A. Um, but I think that's a really fascinating. I, I did get a couple of people who said, like, this is really interesting. Um, and so I, I think uh, this topic really has resonated uh, with our students and our audience here tonight. Um, so as I'm giving people a chance to write a Q&A, um, or to, to raise their hand. Uh, maybe just one question to start us off. Um, I think the COVID-19, uh, you know, experience we went through is something that's really interesting. Um, do we see any other tensions within the liberal project, perhaps about um, the idea of us being rational and industrious and how we are rational and industrious and we try to uh, engage in uh, this project and how that might fit in with the need to balance uh, the household and balance the education of our children? Um, so what do you mean, like in terms of the the difficulty of doing home education and 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 kind of private tutors as a because we have to go make money. And so that doesn't give us the opportunity. Yeah. Yes. In that sense, I think, uh, you know, Lockwood talks about in some thoughts that concerning education talks about this is more of a said for the uh, the upper class and it's the polishing of the gem. And hopefully this then will be an example for the others. Right. But I understand that this type of you know, setting this type of household can do something that, you know, perhaps those in the merchant class can't. Um, and so for those of us in America who are, you know, working as Franklin, um, what might we learn about the uh, liberal tradition uh, when we try to balance that while we were doing uh, home homeschooling or unschooling? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's exactly the difficulty that Franklin saw himself facing, right? That work you know, that part of what Locke had done, Locke and Adam Smith and these other liberal thinkers had done is to transform the value of work, to elevate the value of work into a virtue, right, at the expense of leisure. Uh, and so when work is a virtue and, in, you know, industriousness and thrift and all these things that Franklin himself extols, then you end up with very little free time. Uh, and so you have this difficulty, which is that you then can't devote yourself to your children's education in the way that Locke would have wanted us to, uh, be precisely because we're following like Locke's other, you know, uh, exhortations to work really hard and be industrious and rational. And so I think that's where the American compromise really is a contribution, an original contribution to the larger Western tradition, right? Because what it advances is a kind of uh, 
acceptance of institutional schooling because there's a necessity for it because now your parents are working because you know they're either on the farm or they're working in their their trade and they're not able to stay home with you and teach you so we are going to need schools to do some kind of minimal education and that's sort of accepted by the liberal tradition right the liberal tradition is not anti-school in the sense that it seeks to abolish schools uh but we want to retain some of Locke's skepticism of the sort of intellectually and morally deforming effects of schools by not treating schools very respectfully, uh, not treating, treating teachers very respectfully, right? We have a kind of popular culture that does nothing but deride schools, deride teachers, right? Treats this as like the experience that you have to rebel against if you're like an interesting person. Uh, and, you know, we see that all through the 20th century and we see it in the 19th century. And I think that's really a kind of unique and original American contribution to political thought that education can be both institutional without being totalizing, that it can be, you know, we can have schools, institutional schooling where people come together and are sort of forced to be together. But we have a kind of culture that pushes back against it and moderates its influence. Um, and that I think when we get to the 20th century and we see in political thought a lot of, you know, utopian totalitarian projects of social engineering that are grounded in education, right, you might say, well, these are efforts to sort of bring Plato's vision in the Republic to fruition in real life. Uh, America has kind of resources to fight against that. Whereas a lot of Western European countries have these very centralized education systems, right? They, you know, everything is administered from one, one place. They have uniform curricula and it becomes very hard for them to resist these kinds of centralizing impulses to make everything uniform, right? And to use education to kind of re-engineer society in ways that might end up being very nefarious. Wonderful. Uh, Chris has a question here. Uh, Chris asks, could you please give us your definition of the true purpose of education? Is it to make the student a better, more moral person or a more happy citizen? Well, that depends on your regime. Uh, as, as all thinkers on education have taught us from Plato to Locke to Rousseau to Dewey, uh, you know, that depends on what the regime thinks the, the purpose of, of your education should be. I think if you're asking about American education in particular, um, Americans have been very unwilling to give a single cohesive or decisive uh, definition of the true purpose of education. And I think it this plays into this kind of skepticism of schooling, which is that we don't want to empower schools too much. And so we are kind of at cross purposes, right? And we, we force on schools these tasks that are contradictory, like they're supposed to make you into productive, economically productive citizens so that you can go and get a job, right? Give you vocational skills, make you employable, right? So that's one task of education. And that has been argued since the 18th century as one of the central tasks of American education. So there's a long tradition of giving this kind of vocational account. And there's an equally long tradition of giving a totally civic account of education, that the purpose of education is to make you a good citizen, to help you to understand your natural rights, to help you to understand the kind of philosophical underpinnings of our republic, right? And then to understand the actual laws uh, that govern us. And these are at odds. Uh, and, you know, this has not really bothered Americans. I mean, you know, it bothers us when we try to reconcile them, but it doesn't bother Americans in the large sense that we just continue to expect schools to do both of these things. And then this question of the pursuit of happiness of making a real individual out of you uh, is a third kind of argument that we have seen not as long as the other two, uh, because generally schools, for at, the, at least at the outset, had this kind of uniformity in Posing sense. Uh, and so you become an individual somewhere else, not in the school. But as schools become the more universal experience in the United States, as they're compulsory, as everybody has to experience them, then people, especially progressive educators, start worrying that the schools are too conformist and we have to make school curricula that are more individuated, that can, you know, help you to flourish as an individual and bring out your distinctive qualities. And so 20th century progressive education is kind of an effort to throw this third thing in that you bring up a happy, to make you happy, right? To make you flourishing, to bring out all of your individual potential. 
Uh, and that's also now part of the mainstream sort of understanding of education. So you could say all three of these things are at play at most schools most of the time. And even if you just talk to people about their understanding of education, uh, all those things are at play. I mean, if you were to ask me, I would say that the bringing out of individual potential is probably the most important of these things in some higher sense. But, you know, we live in a country and you need to have a job. And you need to be, you know, competent at being a citizen. You need to know how to associate with other people to get things done. So I'm not going to deny the value of these other things, too. Wonderful. I'm going to uh, uh, get uh, John here the ability to uh, ask a question um, as he's got his hand up. So hopefully, John, you can unmute yourself. See if give John here a second. See if he can get himself unmuted. Well, perhaps while we wait to see if uh, John can get unmuted, I do have a question here from Steve uh, in the Q and A that typed in. Uh, Steve uh, writes: uh, Some of today's school haters on the right of the side of the political spectrum are nostalgic about the days when public schooling promoted uh, conformist values uh, they agree with, but are distasteful of what they see as new woke conformity. But does withdrawing public school leave citizens ill-prepared to deal with increasingly diverse and rapid changing society? Um, so it seems the question is, um, you know, how, how does uh, leaving from public school uh, perhaps affect one's ability to engage with uh, society in a diverse society. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of been the criticism leveled at homeschooling since the outset, right? I mean, that homeschoolers, because they don't go to school at all, right, for whatever, I mean, they're they're on the left, they're on the right, but whatever their reasons are, they withdraw entirely from school, uh, that they're like weird and unsocialized. That's basically what people have, you know, suggested for 30 years and that this is a really bad idea for your children, because if you, you know, were to homeschool your children, they're going to turn out to be kind of like weirdos uh, at best. Uh, there's no evidence for that, actually. Uh, I mean, some people do become really weird, uh, but they probably were going to be anyway. Lots of people who go to school become really weird. Also, you probably remember them from your school days. Uh, but on the whole, there's no evidence that your sort of social skills are impaired by withdrawing from school. Now you could say if this happened on a mass scale, because as I mentioned in the talk, I mean, we're talking about 5% of Americans are withdrawing from schooling entirely. You could say, well, a lot of people go to private school. Right now that's about 10% of school age children are enrolled in some kind of private school, but they're still socialized there. Uh, and it's the if the fear is that, well, private schools are too homogenous uh, and that won't prepare people to deal with diversity, um, I mean, again, we've had private schools in the United States all throughout our history. It doesn't seem to have posed any kind of problem like that in the past. Um, so American society has always been diverse. We've just prioritized different axes. So now we don't care about all the different Protestant sects and we don't consider that to be like a serious challenge or social tension. But it's hard to recall this, but in the 19th century, that was a really big so a source of social tension. And the fact that there are Catholics and Protestants and different kinds of Protestants and, you know, there's Mormons, uh, like we went to war over the Mormon question. Uh, and so I think we today tend to think of diversity in a very narrow framework in the way that it seems most politically salient to us, which is to say racial diversity, ethnic diversity. And we say like, oh, well, we just can't get along on those lines. We need to bring people together so that they can learn to get along. Uh, but, you know, we've always had these questions of sort of inter-civic conflict. And, you know, we've had actually more violence in the past over them than we have now. So it's not obvious, I think, that the question of school composition is the deciding factor in the larger sort of civic harmony in the United States. Um, and then this question about socialization broadly, um, I mean, I think it's a really fascinating thing that we just believe that's home. So, I mean, you know, and not that I would impugn your belief in this, like this is just a kind of reflexive thought that homeschooling will make you weird. Uh, and homeschooling doesn't make you weird. 
at least we have zero evidence that it does. Um, and so, yeah, I think if we did this on a wide scale, it would really change uh, the social dynamic in the United States. If like a majority of students were not in public school or not in any school at all. Um, but you, we do have a precedent for that. I mean, the 19th century was a time when the majority of children didn't go to school. And it's, you know, there were dysfunctional aspects of American society, uh, but they don't largely seem to have arisen from a lack of the kind of fraternizing and camaraderie that public schooling builds. Awesome. I think, John, it uh, looks like you have your microphone on. Uh, I'll let you ask your question here. John, we're just getting a couple of beeps from you. Um, well, I can uh, have another question here in the Q and A hopper. Um, John, maybe if the microphone's not working, I said feel free to write it in too, and I can read it here for you. Um, Hoshik asks, uh, what are your thoughts on the influence of household income on education, uh, potentially intensifying inequality? Uh, for instance, students from higher income backgrounds might have better performance on tests or access uh, additional curriculum through liberal education methods. Uh, do you believe that European styles, which emphasize more equal opportunities, presents a preferable uh, alternative for comparison? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the sources today of a kind of resurgence of what I'm calling the democratic tradition, right? That there's this concern about growing uh, socioeconomic inequality and that schools are exacerbating that inequality, right? So especially private schools, elite schools um, are exacerbating that inequality. So you have a lot of people who write on the theory or philosophy of education in academia making arguments, for example, for abolishing private schools forcing everybody into the public school system, right? And then, you know, there's all of these sort of subsidiary arguments about how we can equalize the public schools themselves, which are not equal as they're sort of set up in most states because they depend on property taxes and those are variable across the state. So high income uh, neighborhoods can support schools more effectively than low income neighborhoods and so on. So you have arguments about equalizing property tax bases so that all schools are equally funded. All those arguments are alive and in play now, uh, precisely because people are worried about the effect of socioeconomic inequality channeled through schooling and sort of reproducing inequality and maybe even exacerbating making inequality or making the gaps bigger. Um, I think that the, the problem with those sorts of arguments um, is that we have never tried, I mean, it would be unconstitutional to force everybody into the public school system to do the kinds of things that these, these political theorists want us to do, right, would come at, an, at a really serious political cost to us and a cost to our regime, which is that it would really involve a kind of deep sort of undermining of what we understand to be individual freedom in the United States, what the Constitution has been understood to mean by individual freedom and so on. Um, I mean, you can make sort of changes around the margins, uh, but I think to fully equalize or level schooling would would raise real questions, constitutional questions and questions about American liberty. Uh, the other problem is that the kinds of advantages that come from socioeconomic difference uh, do not end at schooling. And so this is something that when you read it sort of in the political theory literature about this, right, it's also your parents' education right, gives you all kinds of advantages. Your parents' jobs give you all kinds of advantages. And I mean, it comes down at one point, somebody has made the argument like reading to your children before bed. Some parents do it. Some parents don't. The parents who do it, they're giving their kids an unfair advantage. So the problem with this argument is when you sort of follow it all the way through to its logical endpoint is you kind of have to level down to the lowest common denominator.
right? If we're going to say you can't have private schools, you can't have, let's say, after school tutoring that your wealthy, your parents are going to pay for. You can't have the advantages, whatever advantages your parents could possibly bestow upon you that somebody else's parents cannot. Those advantages have to be leveled down. You're going to get to a point where you really have to level down extremely far. And the, the sort of bedrock of this difference is the family, right? That's the real issue. It's the socioeconomic advantages, not of the school, but of the family. And it's the differences between families that are the actual engine of this inequality, right? They're just kind of filtered through the school. And so you would have to ask yourself, how far are you willing to go to equalize conditions? Are you willing to abolish the family? Uh, because ultimately, I mean, the, the point about reading to your kids before bed, right, it's these small things that parents, you know, more affluent, more educated parents do that are replicating themselves in their children, right? And so I think when you raise this argument, you have to think, how far are we willing to go? Uh, and so, you know, the European example of having a more centralized equal education system it's not really true in certain ways. It kind of depends what you mean by equality, because they also have extreme forms of tracking, what we call tracking in the United States, that most Americans would not accept. Like that you are, you know, you whether you're going to go to college is determined by a test that you take when you're 12, which then determines what kind of high school you go to, whether you're going to go to a college preparatory high school or a vocational high school or something else in between. Uh, and I think Americans would also find that very inegalitarian. So it's a really difficult trade-off, but I think that it's not simply that we can look at Europe and say, that's more egalitarian uh, because it's egalitarian in a certain way. And then it's extremely inegalitarian in another way, which is in terms of the kind of ranking and merit sort of sorting that they do, we would find to be kind of appalling. Um, and so, I mean, that, that's there's, there's these trade-offs in becoming like Europe. And that's part of what I'm trying to convey by this point about the liberal tradition, like it looks bad, you know, from the democratic perspective, but it preserves a lot of things that we also think are very important to us uh, when we sort of think through what we care about in education. Oh, absolutely, it reminds me uh, one time in uh, graduates when we were talking about uh, Plato's Republic and Steve Ferdy, you know, came out and said, I think the most unfair thing you have is who your parents are, right? That's, that's the bottom line you should take from this, you know, talking about education is, that's the thing you have no control over of your life uh, and that's going to change your life dramatically. Um, so that absolutely reminds me of that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the challenge, right? I mean, how far can we go to use education to equalize those sort of, you know, inborn familial inequalities? We might have to go really far. And that's, I think, something we would not be willing to do if we sort of saw what that required. Absolutely. Uh, John uh, wrote in, um, John Dewey wrote and taught six decades to influence the creation of a modern professional education system, uh, recognizing his firm belief that teachers should prevent out-of-date traditions um, and allowing children to learn uh, as much as they could on their own time. Uh, could you please discuss the impact uh, that our immense system of educating teaching professionals has on education? Yeah. So John Dewey is a great example of this kind of progressive desire to import the critique, the liberal critique of schools into schools. Uh, and so, I mean, he's obviously he's very influenced. If you read, you know, Democratic ed Education, he's very influenced by Rousseau and by the book Emile. Uh, and his conclusion from reading Emile is that we should just do Emile's education in school, which is exactly what Rousseau says you should never do. It's not possible. Uh, but but Dewey thinks, well, under modern conditions, like we don't need to worry about that prohibition. We can do it. And that in general has been kind of the impulse of progressive education since the beginning of the 20th century, um, which is that precisely because they kind of accept and they see the critiques that, you know, Locke and Rousseau make about schooling, that it is kind of tyrannical, that it is conformist. We have to find a different kind of pedagogy that can, you know, allow for individuation and for, for students to pursue their own passions and not be, you know, squashed by the system or whatever. Um, and so... The interesting thing about progressive education is it is a democratic theory that has been basically done only for elites. 
in so in the sense that it's not i mean it's been kind of incorporated into public schools now but originally really for the first half of the 20th century it was very expensive to get a progressive education right so if you think about montessori schooling um all of these like european ideas uh you got those are private schools you have to pay private school tuition to have your child have access to this kind of education even though that was not dewey's goal at all he wanted it to be democratically available but the problem is it's very hard to scale it for a public school classroom. You need small classrooms, right? Few kids. Uh, when you've got 40 kids in a classroom, it's very hard to individuate your curriculum for all of them. And so what has happened is that as progressive education has become mainstream and become part of the sort of professional education of teachers, uh, it's been kind of done halfway because uh, it couldn't be otherwise, because it's hard to scale it to the environments of large public schools. And so you get kind of a, a talking about individuating education, but the reality looks nothing like what Dewey describes in, in Democracy and Education or in his books on pedagogy, because it's it's simply impossible. So I think that there's a certain kind of internal contradiction in what Dewey sought which is that school just cannot do the things that he was hoping for it to do. And that Rousseau is really right, that this is something that you have to, you know, sort of seek outside of institutional education. And we're better off trying to limit what, you know, school is capable of or tr limiting it in our minds and not trying to make school do more than it can do and leaving a little bit more to the world outside of school as its own form of education. We have uh, another attendee uh, who asked, um, the United States education system uh, seems based on the Prussian model, uh, one made to instill obedience in their citizens to make good soldiers. Uh, some critics say the US system was influenced by giants um, like Rockefeller or JP Morgan. Um, do you think this holds up to any type of scrutiny that this is an accurate description of an American system? Yeah, no, not at all. Although the reason people argue this is because Horace Mann, who was the superintendent of the Massachusetts public schools and was the sort of first and most famous promoter of the common schools movement, did go to Prussia on a kind of, you know, visit to see how things were going with their educational system and published this very glowing report about what he saw in the Prussian educational system that sort of argued that the Massachusetts common schools should become more like the Prussian system. But nobody else wanted to do this. Uh, and it was not done. And no, I mean, American public schooling is not modeled on Prussian schooling. Prussian schooling is very centralized. It's sort of highly differentiated. This is, I mean, this is the sort of basis of the schooling where you take a test at age 12 and it determines whether you go to gymnasium, which is college preparatory school, and then you can go on to the university or you're sent to vocational school and you can never go to the university under the Prussian model. So it's like very highly graded. Um, and that's never what American education was like. I mean, we didn't even have tracking until the mid 20th century. Um, and so I think that that's when the new left wants to argue for homeschooling, this is the kind of argument that it makes in the 1960s and 1970s that a lot of these anti-school activists make. Uh, they're historically mistaken about what the American education system was, you know, has always aspired to be. Um, and I think to some degree, they exaggerate what actual public schools are like in the 1960s. Um, but that is very much their argument against schooling and their argument that in favor of these alternative forms of schooling, like homeschooling, like unschooling. I mean, people read Summerhill. They're very influenced by that. Um, so that argument that you make, is, it's in circulation and it becomes rhetorically important and politically important for the new left in the 1960s. But I don't think it's historically accurate really at all. Um, although. American education becomes more uniform and more kind of, you know, factory like in the 1950s and 60s. But that's just because everybody's in it. Uh, they just have more students, but it's never its aspiration. And, you know, if you think about what leading educators and educational thinkers in the United, in the United States in the 20th century are arguing for, it's much closer to John Dewey's progressive education than to any kind of Prussian argument. No wonder all. Well, the wonderful. I think that again, it really helps to dissect and know. Okay, here's here's an inkling of truth, um, but that goes for a long way. That's not actually the case. Um, one of our students, Danielle, asked, um, "How do you feel about homeschooling 
giving you an opportunity to gain just as much education as public school? Will homeschoolers struggle with feeling sheltered by not interacting with other kids on a daily basis? Or can they overcome that? Yeah, I mean, I think it totally, I mean, homeschooling is as varied as the people who do the homeschooling. That's its nature, right? So if it's your parents, right, it just totally depends on what your parents decide to do with you, right? So they can offer you a really rigorous academic education, one that goes way beyond what a public school could offer you, right? If you're a very advanced student, it's easy to become bored in in a school setting because the school setting is always pitched towards kind of the average student in that grade. So if you're advanced and your parents or whoever is homeschooling you are willing to sort of work up to your level, then you could go way farther than a public school. Uh, or if your parents have a different view of education, so like unschooling, for example, is a view that like we just shouldn't teach anything. And children will learn what they want to learn naturally, and they'll pursue it naturally. And we should not be pushing them to do subjects or to do this or that. Um, and maybe under that situation, you will learn less. Um, that's sort of the wager of homeschooling is we're going to sort of trust parents to do what's best for their children. And therefore, the outcomes cannot possibly be uniform. Um, to the degree that we have data about homeschooling, which is very hard to get actually because homeschooling is so unregulated. So it's hard to get reliable, large scale data about what's going on with homeschoolers. But to the degree that we have data, they seem to do just as well academically um, and they do not have weird social defects. Um, although that is often the sort of prejudice against homeschooling. So the reason that this happens largely is because number one, a lot of homeschool kids have siblings. In fact, the vast majority of them. So they do interact with other kids. The ones who are religious are involved in church and they have church youth groups and other sorts of groups where they do interact a lot with other children. Um, and the other thing is that they interact more with adults. And I think that's something we underestimate as deforming about our school system that is sort of deforming, which is that because we have graded schools, which means that like when you're six years old, you're in the first grade. And when you're seven years old, you're in the second grade and so on. You spend so much of your childhood with people who are exactly your age and nobody else, right? So there's like a teacher, you know, you have a few teachers in the school that you interact with, your teacher, the gym teacher, the art teacher, you have your parents, maybe you have your grandparents around, right? And a couple neighbors, and that's it. You may never encounter people who are old. You may never encounter babies, right? I mean, after you get to a certain point, like your parents stop having children. And so you're not dealing with babies anymore. And you have this very narrow age cohort experience where your entire social world is other people who are exactly your age. And arguably that does not conduce to your healthy social development. And homeschool kids don't have that. They have a more organic encounter with the outside world, right? So they're around adults a lot more. Uh, and so they're, they, it might seem weirder that they're actually able to interact better with adults we now treat that as weird because we're so used to the standard, which is just interacting with people your own age. Uh, but actually, it might be healthier. Uh, so, I mean, I'm I'm in favor of homeschooling. Uh, I don't personally do it. I mean, I think it should just be an option. And if that's something you want to commit to, it's harder than sending your kids off to school. Uh, but you should have the freedom to do that. Uh, Hannah asks, uh, could you explain your opinion about the standardized test in the United States, such as the ACT? Tests like the ACT can create challenges for some students for college admissions, similar to the European sorting test. Um, so where does the ACT and that those types of tests fit in the American education system? Yeah, I mean, the United States does not use testing in the same way that Europe does. Um, our testing is not determinative. Right. So it's certainly good to do well on the ACT and it will help your chances to get into a selective university and all of that. Uh, but if you don't do well on it, it doesn't mean you're not going to go to a university. And it's also not the only thing that a university considers. Um, whereas when you think about how, you know, in Europe, this, the test to get into gymnasium is like one test. Um, you know, to get into the university in Britain, you have these tests, the A-levels, and they're highly determinative, if not totally determinative, of what your university you can get into. Um, so the United States is actually on the much sort of more relaxed end of testing um, in the sense that it's it determines so much less of your outcome in life than it does in other countries. But I think, you know, to the degree that we use it, I don't think it's irrational to use testing, right? I mean, th these institutions want to get a sense of, you know, what 
what is conveyed by a student's transcript. And precisely because we have this enormously decentralized school system with all these different school districts of totally different qualities, different curriculums. I mean, they're not, you know, school in Massachusetts and school in California today, you're going to have pretty much the same similar experiences, but there will still be differences. And if you go to a private school, if you're homeschooled, like how is a university supposed to know, you know, what your transcript is conveying? So I think the United States uses testing in a way that's more like, you know, stop gap measure to figure out some baseline of where people are. Um, and I think that that makes sense. It fits into the larger sort of purposes of our educational system, which is we want to allow for variety, right? But when we do that, you know, then the institutions that you're voluntarily applying to, universities, right, that you might want to attend, have some reasonable cause to want to have a sense of where do you stand relative to other people precisely because we can't just compare you based on your grades or your class rank or something like that because there's 13,000 other schools, other public schools that, you know, with different kinds of class ranks and grading systems and private schools and homeschools and all of these sorts of things. Awesome. We, uh, we have one last question here. And so I think we're uh, we're just coming in right on time there. Uh, Chris asked, um, just to, for us to maybe imagine some of the lessons we learned from COVID. Um, did we learn, you know, better ways um, through technology instead of spending on physical capital infrastructure? Or do we learn other ways to engage in social activities? Or what are, what are the lessons we can take away maybe from COVID uh, for the American education system? Um, I think that the lessons we can take away are that actually we cannot deliver education better through technology for a, a very large subset of students. So my children, for example, were in preschool during COVID. They would not have benefited from online education, I can tell you, especially because they were illiterate. So it would be very hard for them to engage in online education. And, you know, we sent them to a, a physical school and they had to like be masked and all that stuff. But that was ultimately a much better experience at that age than any kind of online option would be. Obviously that changes as you get older by high school, certain kinds of online delivery might be really useful. Um, and we've actually been experimenting with that for a long time. So we've had online schooling even before COVID, where if you live in a district that doesn't offer, for example, a lot of AP courses, you could take an AP course through an online kind of module through the state. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that there are certain ways that online education or online delivery of education can complement regular education, but it doesn't seem based on any kind of empirical data that came out of COVID, like test score declines, um, behavior issues and things like that, that online delivery, total online delivery of um, school content was an improvement over what was going on with physical education where you were physically present in the building. Um, so, I mean, I think the main thing that COVID has taught us is actually that these really large, these mammoth school systems, especially in cities, are really inflexible and unable to adapt to crises because um, those are the schools that were closed for the longest, even when it became really clear that school closings were not really doing that much to diminish the spread of COVID and harming students. Um, and so I think part of what COVID has taught us, if it's taught us anything, is that like we should be wary of centralization because centralization creates inflexibility. It creates bureaucracies that can't really respond to rapid shifts in, in conditions uh, and that we're sort of better off. I mean, the suburban schools opened more quickly. Private schools were very flexible in what they were able to do. And, you know, often they just stayed open throughout the entire pandemic. Um, so I think that's a lot of what we learned. We learned some of the limits of online education. And I think I think one of the main lessons that's going to stay with us actually is about the question of, you know, keeping kids isolated at home um, without their friends. I mean, that was a big problem. It's like they couldn't see their friends. They couldn't. So what school does is give you your your friends who you can hate the world with. Uh, and that was also taken away from people. And we we're still, I think, dealing with a lot of the long term sort of social, behavioral, um, even political fallout from from making that decision. Um, and I think it actually is. I mean, it's might be bad in a lot of ways, but it will be very informative and in, like thinking in the future about how we want to use technology and education. No, absolutely. I can speak from my experiences. said we had a first grader um, and we kept her home for that year. And while her math went up to third grade level in one year, um, that loss of having those friends that could, you know, I can hate mom and dad and it's okay to hate them because they don't know I hate them right now because I'm not at home with them. 
um, that that was a loss. It wasn't wasn't the same. So uh, yeah, there is that balancing point um, that we lost with that. Well, I, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kuzanzan, for uh, joining us tonight and, and, and for uh, for answering our questions. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, you know, hopefully at some point, maybe we can get you to come visit Jacksonville, Alabama, too. Yeah, I'm sorry. I couldn't no. be there this time. You, you're busy. You're in demand. Someday. You are. Absolutely. The, the invitation is open to come visit us. Uh, you know, you have to try Alabama barbecue and tell us how it compares to Texas barbecue. OK. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, we want to thank the Jack Miller Center and Alabama Humanities Alliance for supporting this lecture series. Uh, we look forward to you having, uh, uh, having you join us again here uh, in February when we walk, uh, welcome Dr. Dan Cohen uh, from Rhodes University uh, to come talk about the Constitution. Well, everyone have a great night and we'll see you soon.